Before we move on to the High Baroque, let's review mannerism with an oral essay presentation. Since I don't know which other two works you'll choose, I can't include them in the podcast. And now on to the High Baroque. As I mentioned in my last lecture, Europe at the start of the 17th century was divided between Catholics and Protestants of different varieties, and both kings and religious leaders were fighting to gain or regain adherence, sometimes on the battlefield, sometimes in the printing press, and sometimes in art. From 1545 to 1563, the Council of Trent met in Italy to hammer out a strategy for combating Protestantism. The Council strongly condemned Protestant doctrine, but it also ordered significant reforms to church administration and discipline intended to address some of the corruption that had sparked Luther's attack. That's a lot of history in a sentence or two, but for our purposes, it's most important to know that the Council of Trent not only upheld, but strongly urged the use of religious images. Basically, the church seized on art as a weapon in its fight with Protestantism. It was a smart move. The austere Protestant churches with no art and sometimes even no music might appeal to the intellect, but they had a hard time competing on an emotional level. The Catholic Church actually won back many former Protestants during the Counter-Reformation. So this is a useful summary slide. And to sum this up in a phrase that you should drag into any essay you write on Baroque art, the church and the artists that patronized basically went for Hyde all about religious theater. Big, boldly covered, colored, carefully staged, packed with movement and emotion, with spiraling figures and diagonal lines of sight. It was art designed to excite and even inflame the senses. We will return to the points in this slide repeatedly, so consider this just an introduction. In this lecture, we're looking at the stage setting for these Baroque productions, Baroque churches, and at some point, and at their, some of their most famous props, Baroque sculpture. I realized as I started preparing for this lecture that today we will see our last churches among the required works. Neither is what is arguably the most famous Renaissance slash Baroque church in the world, St. Peter's in the Vatican. Since I teach at a Catholic school, I can't really skip St. Peter's entirely, but I will race through it pretty quickly, mostly to introduce this unit's only sculptor, Bernini, whose fingerprints are all over the church. So I just called this a Renaissance slash Baroque church. What Renaissance elements do we see? There's a lot of homage to ancient Greece and Rome in the triangular pediment over the entranceway and the entablature directly below it, in the Corinthian columns and the classic dome, which was designed by Michelangelo. But look at that upper story with its statues and ornate clocks. Those are Baroque elements that a new architect added when he reworked the facade. Note in the process that Michelangelo's dome got shoved to the back and lost some of its prominence. The most dramatic change in St. Peter's was not to its facade, but to the huge piazza that welcomed worshipers to the Eternal City, and you will see they have prepared for crowds. I'd note that this change is usually viewed as very successful aesthetically, and the architect of this piazza, Bernini, was also the most prominent sculptor of the Baroque era and the creator of the required work that generated more questions on the unit test than any other because it has showed up so prominently in past and present college board questions. Bernini was the son of a sculptor and a child prodigy who attracted the interest of the church when he was still a young boy. He became a close friend and confidant of several popes. He was a devout Catholic who attended Mass every morning before beginning work, and he genuinely seems to have believed that his mission was to create work that glorified God. Bernini was also a playwright and the leader of a troupe of actors who performed for popes. So here's a quote from a contemporary who recorded that, and I quote, Bernini gave a public opera wherein he painted the scenes, cut the statues, invented the engines, composed the music, wrote the comedy, and built the theater. Every work that Bernini created is imbued with this sense of what made good theater. So I've chosen this brief clip because it gives you a peek inside St. Peter's and introduces the other great architect of this unit, Borromini. 
The baldacchino stands at the center of St. Peter's Crossing Square and directly under the dome. It marks the place of St. Peter's tomb underneath and houses the high altar where the host resides. The Cathedral Petri houses a relic, the throne of St. Peter's. Both works reinforce key counter-reformation messages. Christ handed the keys of the church to St. Peter and threw him to the Catholic Church. And during the sacrament, the bread and wine actually become the body and blood of Christ. Neither of these shows is a required work, but they could easily show up as a Baroque attribution question. Note the twisted columns, the ornate decoration, and the over-the-top drama that sets the stage for a religious celebration. Well, this work isn't required either, but I refuse to skip it. Bernini's David is all coiled action. It reaches into the space around it, what art analysts call negative space. This David is not Donatello's contemporary contemplative youth or Michelangelo's calm warrior. He is an intense, furious fighter, out to destroy his enemy and save his people. He is a counter-reformation warrior. And here are a couple more non-required Bernini statues again for attribution. Both are attempted rape scenes from classical mythology. We see the dramatic movement, the reach into negative space, the spiraling composition, and the really amazing textures created in marble. Okay, finally, here is Bernini's famous sculpture of the ecstasy of St. Teresa and the over-the-top chapel in which it was housed also designed by Bernini. Bernini did not design the church, which is also a required image, but I'm going to save that to go with our other churches. The Baroque elements of this sculpture should be obvious. Twisting figure, spiring diagonal lines, extension into negative space, and the profound emotion. We also see marble that almost looks like it's melting under the flame of the Holy Spirit. So just what kind of ecstasy is this saint experiencing? I want you to watch a second clip from our Bernini video. The narrator, by the way, is one of my favorite historians, Simon Shama, and you're going to see other clips from his series, The Power of Art. This gives a useful, if sometimes rather startling, introduction to the subject of this work, St. Teresa of Avila. What makes this work even more remarkable is its staging. The chapel is an elaborate theater for the religious drama, complete with an audience of patrons. Let's watch one last video clip. So the College Board includes this church, which houses the Cornaro uh, Chapel, among the required images, although it oddly doesn't list the architect, who's the architect who redesigned the facade of St. Peter's. We'll see the same combination of Renaissance, classical, and Baroque figures. There are some important differences. The triangular pediment is now curved. The columns are square, engaged pilasters, not rounded columns. And we now have those scroll features on the second story. Do you remember what they're called from Greek architecture? Volutes, which are characteristic of Ionic order architecture even though the engaged columns have Corinthian capitals. The tall, narrow design reflects not only Baroque taste, but also the reality of building in Rome, where real estate was pretty scarce. And here is the Borromini church that you saw in the first video clip. Note the undulating curves, what a great word, undulating, and how they alternate between convex and concave surfaces. Just as striking is the extremely ornate geometric pattern of the dome. Renaissance simplicity is a distant memory. Note that Borromini had to figure out how to build an impressive church on a narrow corner lot that faced two intersecting roads. He also had to figure out a way to fit in both a church and a cloister for the religious order's convent. Here's the floor plan that's the required image. And here's a label floor plan and a cutaway that make the construction clearer. The vertical cutaway shows the extraordinary complexity of the church's three-level design. And this photo makes the three zones easier to see. If the convex concave exterior seams seem ornate and entirely unclassical, the interior design is in some ways a throwback to the Renaissance in that it is precisely mathematical. What has changed is the math. I didn't see this mentioned in the readings or podcast, but I had a theory about this oval or ellipse. So I googled Borromini and Kepler and found what I thought I would. 
Kepler's theories of planetary motion were a major influence on Borromini. Remember, this isn't only the time of the Catholic Counter-Reformation. It's also the beginning of the scientific revolution. It was Kepler who discovered that planets moved in elliptical or oval, not circular orbits. So ellipses, turns out, were the geometry of God's creation. Borromini's elliptical dome moreover, can be described with reference to two inscribed circles, which in turn define two triangles. That is all very complicated sounding. The diagram on the right makes it easier to see. Mostly what you should remember is that Borromini wasn't really rejecting the geometric purity of classical Greek and Renaissance Italy. He was just bringing it up to date. Borromini did not employ color with Bernini's abandon. The surfaces of the walls and ceiling are white. But Borromini did provide for theatrical lighting. Windows are hidden in the lower dome, and there are also windows in the side of the lantern. So the illuminated lantern, with its symbol of the Holy Trinity, acts as a kind of spotlight, throwing the coffering of the dome into sharp and deep relief. From the dome, light gradually filters downward to the darker lower body of the church, where the audience, that is the congregation, sits. Drum rolls, please. This is our last required church. The exterior looks a lot like the Church of Santa Vittoria, which houses the Carnero Chapel, pictured here on the right. Il Gesù is the older of the two churches and influenced the design of Baroque churches all over the world. Basically, we see the same classical facade with typical Baroque flourishes, such as the volutes. Il Gesù, however, played a more important role in the history of the Catholic Church. It is the mother church of the Jesuit order, built at the request of the order's founder, St. Ignatius of Loyola. The Jesuits quickly established themselves as educational leaders in the church, and they insisted that Jesuit teachers and students be trained in classical thought as well as theology. They did not reject the Renaissance synthesis of classical thought and Christian faith, which is embodied in this facade. I'm going to share a comment by a Jesuit priest and an art history professor at the Jesuit University of San Francisco, Father Tom Lucas. Quote, this type of facade achieves Ignatius's ideas of the church as a gateway through which the Jesuits emerge for their apostolic activities in the city and the world, and through which the city is drawn into the sacramental life of the church. It stands, carefully oriented to the surrounding streets and piazza, as a great portal inviting the passerby to enter. The biggest battles of the Counter-Reformation were not won by the soldiers of the Holy Roman Empire, who mostly lost their battles. They were won by the soldiers of Christ, led by Ignatius of Loyola, who was a Spanish soldier turned priest. And what a great story that I don't have time to tell. I threw in a few paintings of the Jesuit missionary activities in Japan, Mexico, and Africa, and a painting of St. Ignatius by one of this unit's heavy hitters, Rubens. The opening lines of the Jesuit order's founding document declared that the society was created for, quote, whoever desires to serve as a soldier of God, unquote. The Jesuits were the shock troops of the Counter-Reformation, and they completely bought into the Counter-Reformation belief that art, wielded properly, was a potent weapon in the battle for souls. By the way, in 2013, the church elected its first Jesuit pope, who took the name of Francis. So here are the statues of St. Ignatius in the niches of the facade. What's he trampling? I wasted about 45 minutes trying to find out. One theory I read was that he was trampling savages. Another is he was trampling Protestants. I have no confidence that either of these answers is correct. He might well be trampling ignorance. But whomever he's crushing, this was one forceful fellow. The layout of Il Jesu reflected the Jesuits' mission and the proclamations of the Counter-Reformation. The nave is a huge hall with the altar moved up front into a shallow apse. All attention is drawn to that altar. So let's hear again from Professor and Father Lucas. Quote, the interior accentuates the two great functions of a Jesuit church. Its large central nave with the laterally placed pulpit serves as a great auditorium for preaching, and the highly visible and prominent altar serves as a theatrical stage for the celebration of the real presence in the Eucharist. 
The ceiling frescoes came later, after the order had accumulated some serious cash. This is high Baroque drama, with the action spilling, as it were, off the stage and down toward the audience. More from Father Lucas. Quote, the vault fresco representing the glory of the holy name of Jesus seems to open up a hole in the ceiling through which heavenly light pours onto downward cascading colossal figures and into the nave and altar. Thus, the Jesuit church becomes not only a gateway to and from the world, but also a window into paradise. These theatrical effects are created by illusionistic painting, another favorite Baroque technique. So here's a little vocabulary download. You've encountered trompe l'oeil or fool the eye before. It's a broad term for illusions, such as painting walls to look as if they have three-dimensional columns or statues. De Soto and Sue is a technique that uses foreshortened figures and an architectural vanishing point to create a perception of space on a ceiling. It means basically looked at from below, look up, looking up from below. Quadratura involves painting architectural features on a flat surface to create a three-dimensional sense of space. Leaving aside these technicalities, what is the effect? What impression does this ceiling leave with the person sitting in the pews? Heaven is bursting into earth. The spiritual is invading the earthly. To quote Baroque composer George Friedrich Handel's Hallelujah Chorus, which is quoting Revelation 11:15, the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. Hallelujah. <laughs>